Welcome to the Digging Deeper Bible Study with Pastor Lewis Cooper on the campus of Unity Baptist Church in Bonaire, Georgia. Join us now as we begin our study on the book of Genesis. All right, tonight we are picking up our study in Genesis on Genesis chapter 5. So I trust you've got your Bibles open and uh, have your sheet with the pencil or pen ready to jot down some comments tonight as we work through our discussion. So I've entitled this particular chapter, The Curse Continues. Last time we looked at chapter 4 and really it was a genealogy of Cain. And what we saw was how sin just continued to escalate and how the culture developed, and it looked like things were in a positive role as far as the things that man became very, more, became very innovative in ways of basically dealing with life under the curse of sin. But we also saw um, the negative, and we saw when we finally got down toward the end of the chapter that Lamech really just taunted God with uh, his boast of, you know, Cain had the curse of God and judgment against those that would kill him. God said sevenfold would come upon them. And he said, you know, I'm so bad that if God was to do that for me, it would be 70 times seven. I mean, it would just be this insurmountable. And just again, show the arrogance of man uh, in the fall. And we're going to look at that some tonight, but again, more and more in line with Adam and his family. But still, when we got to the end of chapter four, uh, verse 25 and 26 was the contrast, because there we see Adam has uh, another son named Seth. And it was through Seth's lineage, Seth's Seth line, that men began to call upon God. And we ended our time talking about, that's not necessarily talking about prayer, as it is in praise and worship and acknowledging who God is. And that's something Avery and I were talking about today. Whenever we worship we have to do two things for worship to be, um, well, fit the definition of giving praise to an object or being. First of all, we have to uh, understand or acquire uh, understanding of the object or the person, God, that we're worshiping. But then the other part is to appreciate. We have to really come to see the value this relationship, this knowledge that we have has. Well, Seth line brings that back into bear. And one of the things that we're going to see tonight, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, is that when we see Seth born and then we begin this lineage, we need to remember this longevity of those that lived. They were, a lot of, the majority of them were living all at the same time. So you can imagine 900 years plus of Adam being in your presence being in the family, you can kind of see a family reunion, and there's, you know, great, 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 great granddaddy Adam over there, and he's still recollecting the days before the fall and the walk with God. And then the bitterness of the fall and the remorse and conviction we would hope that he would have. We made a terrible, grievous mistake. And I believe they knew that, not only from the moment that they were expelled from the garden, but eventually what did we see happen that never happened before? It was the murder of their son by their other son. And they were burying that. And so he's telling them all of this. So you can imagine just over the generations, uh, and we've got 13 that's listed here, these saints of old are alive, and they're talking about what it was before. And, uh, and that plays in a lot to where we get down to the seventh generation um, with Enoch. So, the curse continues. Two sections. I'm breaking the chapter up into two parts. And like I said, we'll focus on part one tonight. Uh, Adam's family continues under the curse. Um, simply put, we're just going to see Adam have a son, Seth. Seth has a son, and then bam, 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 it just continues. But with that, I want to look for a question. All right, question. What does this chapter reveal regarding hope despite the curse? Because like I said, all of these heads of these generations are living 900 years plus. 900 years plus 
under the curse of sin. And when we say under the curse of sin, we need to go beyond just what they were wrestling with in their person or with their family. But remember, we've got our other kin, the lineage of Cain. And we saw how their uh, wickedness and how it was growing. And we know, most of us in here, if not all of us, we're familiar with where chapter 6 takes us, that man becomes so corrupt that he doesn't have a single thought in his heart to his head that is not evil. Not a single thought. That's how they're described. And again, this is just, we're seeing the curse of sin and, and leading up to a point that we'll look tonight with uh, Adam. So, with that, let's look at verses 1 through 3 tonight. And we'll start there. And what I want us to title this section with, The Curse of Sin and Its Inherent Nature. The Curse of Sin and Its Inherent Nature. And we'll look at some things here. So let's start out with, this is the generation, or the book of generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man, or Adam, in the day when they were created. Now verse 1 and 2 is sort of like the heading of this section. It's letting us know this is where humanity was. God created them. God blessed them. In other words, well, you can just imagine, when God blesses you, that's a good thing, right? And think about, we know the joy of the blessing, but we still have the distance of our fellowship kind of where ebbs and flows because of our sinful natures. But for Adam, what he and Eve had in the garden was pure, intimate fellowship and communion with their creator. And so this is what the writer Moses on the expression of the Holy Spirit is letting us see and be reminded of. This is where humanity started and this is who started it and had blessed them in his creation of them and how he was taking care of them. Verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image, and named him Seth. Now, we were introduced to Seth earlier in the last chapter, verse 25, 26. But again, Moses isn't being redundant here. He's making a point. Adam was created in the likeness of who? Of God. And again, we addressed that likeness, that image earlier. It wasn't that he was a demigod or a god yet to be full-blown god, uh, like our Mormon neighbors believe. But what he believed, or what he was saying is, is that Adam was perfect in reflecting the character and the nature that he had that God gave him of himself, which allowed that communion, which allowed that fellowship. Well, when sin came and disobedience and they were expelled, that fellowship, that communion was broken because of sin. And a part of, and this is where theologians go back and forth on this, a part of the image some would go so far as to say Adam lost that image. Others would say it was marred, or in other words, it had become less than what it was in the beginning. And that's, that's where I stand. Because, again, the scripture is clear. We've all been created in the image of God. We are unique, and there's nothing that has lost that. And where we see that being redeemed is under the new covenant in Christ. Because, see, there's the connection. When it says that we are new creations, new creatures in Christ, what we're saying is, is that when you're born again and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you, He gives you that new heart, you now possess sort of, well, not sort of, a regenerated image of God that now can commune, but it's not fully matured. I'm, I'm kind of using that kind of terminology. So we have the process of sanctification where we grow. But we have, as Peter would say, that divine nature. We participate. We have that unction in us because we've been born again. And we know ultimately, being this new creature in Christ, God's will is, is that we be conformed to what? 
the image of Christ. And again, the Son of God has perfect communion fellowship with God the Father. So you can see how, again, in our rebirth, God, in essence, has created us anew spiritually and is working in our life, conforming us to Christ, the God-man that we'll talk about in a moment, to have that intimate relationship that Adam had, but even better, because Adam was a creature worshiping his creator. But we are going to be, and this is kind of hard for us to bring our minds around, because we are born again, because we are in Christ, that puts us in a familiar, not familiar, but a familiar role with the Father. We're not just one of his creatures now, we're one of his kids in Christ. Adam didn't have that. He was creature to creator. We're child of God to God our Father, who created us, but yet our relationship is much more intimate. Does that make sense? And we'll see that unfold uh, as we go through Genesis and look at some other things. But before we go too far with that, I want to back back up to verse 1, because there's a word in there that's very important that we don't just need to read and, and go on, because literally, literally when it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam, that's a unique phrase, and that word generations, if you remember several years ago, uh, three or four it was, we went through Genesis, we talked about this word generations. In Hebrew, it's toledot, toledot. Um, and if you were to write that out, let me just put it this way, toledot, okay? That's, that's the way you'd say it phonetically uh, in English. But again, this word is unique because it talks about the generations. And so we think about, we think about generations, we think about you know, lineage. But there's another place this word comes up. In English, it's been translated a little bit different. Turn over to Genesis chapter 2. I think I, well, I got the slide right here. I think we can do this. Yeah. This is the account, and this is the word. This is toledot, but in English now here, it has been... This is the generations of the heavens and the earth. But instead of choosing the word generation in the English translation like we have in Genesis 5, they use this word account, which better lines up with the definition. Because again, what he's saying is in verse 4, chapter 2, this isn't necessarily the, um, the origin of heaven and earth. This is telling us how heaven and earth evolved. And we know that we have a parallel of what we saw with the creation uh, of heaven and earth in Genesis 1. But here, J chapter 2 takes a different vein. Here we have the introduction of man and then set up for the fall. And what we are learning here is, is this account of the heavens and the earth literally is setting up, this is how the unfolding of God's plan in creation and the heavens, and then their sin. And then the unfolding continues, really spiraling downward, because time we get to chapter 4, chapter 3, we have the fall. We see God's glory in his creation marred by sinful man, disobedient, sin. But then time we get to chapter 4, Sins evolved, spread out as mankind is multiplying. But the problem now is sin is being magnified with the multiplication of these creatures. And so what Genesis 2-4 is setting us up to see is this is the unfolding of the heavens and earth. And then as we go further into the text, how sin comes in and now how sin is marring that. And we saw that with Cain's lineage. We started with Cain. We saw his attitude and his heart toward God in his worship, how it led to the murder of his brother, and then how he became a wanderer, cursed again, double cursed from the ground. Nothing Cain did in the ground was going to bear fruit. And so they had to come up with ideas of how to survive and led to the ingenuity and the the things we saw with the escalation of civilization last time. But again, with that, though, was that downward spiral. 
to where we get to the end of chapter 4 with Lamech, who is, I said, taunting God and boasting about his murderous attitude and such a disregard for the sanctity of life that he's killing people just because you bumped into me. And he brags about it. I mean, that's how far down it had got. But there's more to be seen. So with this, we say, okay, well, that, that's cool, so whatever. But no, it's not whatever. Because there's another place this word is used that's very unique. In the Old Testament, two other places. We have the book of generations of. We have that with Ruth. And we have it in the book of Numbers. But what's really cool to see is what we see in Matthew chapter 1. one. Because here's where we need to understand the connection. And why literally Genesis... And the genealogy of Christ, or we could say the book of Adam and the book of Christ, literally is what the whole Bible centers around. And that's what I want to unfold for us here in just a second. But notice here, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus. Now, we know the New Testament was written in what language? Koine Greek not Hebrew. So we say, well, is it the same word just in Koine Greek? Well, that's a good question. Can we find that out somewhere? We can, because we have a reference, a source called the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, that had been translated into Koine Greek. So when we go to the Septuagint, Matthew chapter 1, 1, what word do you think genealogy is? Toledot. And they translate it to the word Genesis. So that's, that's the Greek word for what word we have in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. But if you were to Go back to the original, to the Hebrew, to this same word, you would see when genealogy is used in chapter 5 for Adam's book, it is Toledot. But in the Septuagint, it's the same thing we have with Jesus. It's Genesis. And we see that as the book of beginnings. And this is how many will talk about this with Jesus. But we know it's not his actual beginning, but what Genesis or what Matthew chapter one shows us with Jesus' genealogy, book of Jesus, is how that he is a descendant of who? Of David. Because again, Matthew is talking about Jesus as the king. So again, for a Jew, that has to be proved. You have to show that you're a part of the lineage of David to be a king of Israel. And Matthew and truthfully, this is the only existing account of a descendant of David in print. So really for the Jews to have a king again and it to be an heir of David, the only place they can turn to is the Bible. But that's what it shows. But again, this isn't all that we see here. There's another interesting thing about these two books. Because this one talks about the book of Adam... This one talks about the book of Jesus. There's something here that's referred to as federal headship. Federal headship. Who's the head of humanity? Who started humanity? I know God's the creator, but of all humanity, where's the beginning? It was Adam. All right? For all of the redeemed... In Christ, who's the head? Jesus. So these are the two heads of the two books. Now the federal part is how they influence their descendants. Now for Jesus, in his book of Jesus, the Messiah, as he says in Matthew chapter 1, and we'll go back and look at that a little closer, his isn't so much looking down as far as past, as it is the beginning of what's ahead. 
Because for everyone in Christ, all the redeemed, Jesus is the beginning. He is that new Adam that Paul talks about in the book of Romans. So what the writer Moses is giving us in Genesis, he is setting the foundation for us to see how the first Adam, how he failed, and how it just brought humanity into this state of corruption. Um, which again, let me, we'll go to that slide right now. But with Jesus, did Jesus fail at anything? No. He was the perfect man. He was God in the flesh. He was the one that showed us how to live rightly as a human being. With God's help, this is how it's done. But these are the two heads. But there's something interesting else. This little sidebar here is kind of interesting. When we look at Genesis, we have 13 generations listed. This is going from Adam to Noah's boys. Remember I showed you this, we had this chart last week. With Adam being number one, when you get down to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, because the only thing we've got to go by who's the oldest is just the order. All we know is when Moses was, not Moses, I keep saying Moses, when Noah was how old? 500 years when he had his boys. He was 500 years old when he had his boys. Now, the thing that's interesting here, go back here, 13. How many generations are listed in Jesus' genealogy? Huh? Nope. 14. Now, this is just in Matthew, okay? At the end of that text of the chapter, it says there were 14 generations between Jesus and David. There were 14 generations from Babylon to David. So again, but again, we say, okay, 13, 14. No, because if you were into numerology, what do you think the number 13 stands for? We would say bad luck. We would say bad luck. Apostasy. Apostasy. Rebellion and apostasy. 14. I'll work on your math skills. Two digits added together. What's those digits to equal 14? Seven. So what do we know about sevens? Okay, that's the perfect number. In numerology, it's God's number. Perfect God. Jesus is perfect man. So seven and seven, 14 generations, seven for perfect God, which he's God in the flesh. Another seven, perfect man. He's the perfect God man. This is what numerologists would do to you. And to them, this has cred. I mean, this is like, this is a message. This is validating to them because it's not just, well, you just got a list of names there. No, there's significance to these numbers because remember, everything in the Bible is significant. Now, you can get a little out there with numerology, but still, the Hebrews and most of them that wrote the Bible were either Hebrew or influenced by the Hebrew text. Numbers were significant, just like names. Because we want to see there's a uniqueness to Noah's name. There's a uniqueness to Methuselah's name. And uh, actually, Methuselah's name is going to reflect a revelation that Enoch got that turned his life around. But that's next week. We'll talk about that next week. So, with that then, we got these two books. I want us to look at this. We have, first of all, we're going to look at the book of Adam. And in verse 3, 
When Adam had lived 130 years, he began, became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and the name of him was Seth. So what was the likeness and image of Adam now? Sinful. So what we're saying is then, or what the scripture is saying, is that Seth inherited what? A sin nature. So Seth, being the next in line, we've already seen how that plays out with Cain. But now with Seth, we're seeing this lineage of Adam through the line of Seth. And these are the ones that called upon the name of Yahweh, as the end of chapter 4 told us. But we see with this, the sin nature is still there. So as we go through those 13 generations, that sin nature is passed on and passed on and passed on. Though we don't have a lot of detail about those individuals and the fruits of their sinful nature, but what the scripture is saying here is, every descendant of Adam, every descendant of Adam, which means who? You and I, everybody, have received inherently this likeness and image of Adam, a sinner. You say, well, how does that work? I mean, was it physical? Is it spiritual? It is a reality. It's not an ideology because we saw it fleshed out in chapter 4 through the line of Cain. And it's just the way they act. And we're going to see that grow as we go forward. And literally next week when we look at Enoch, Jude describes how mankind was as Enoch was alive. And especially in those 300 years before he walked on with the Lord. So this evil, this fruit of sin was just magnifying every time a generation and they had kids and they had kids and they had kids. And look at where we are today. The sin nature is real, which takes us to what I'm calling the doctrine of universal depravity. Universal depravity. And not to get on a tangent here, but, you know, we're always looking today even, millennia later, we're looking to point the finger as to why tragedies happen, never getting to the root of the matter. We're always looking at the tangible or an ideology that's the problem or, you know, always something else rather than looking at the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is literally the heart. And there is no other that I'm aware of at this point in my journey, no other religious belief system that goes back and gives to me, credible explanation as to why man is like he is. Now, as we talked earlier, the secular world would say, well, it's our animal instincts, it's survival, and then if that doesn't explain, then we hit the default button, it's a sickness. It's a disease. And so that means it's something that can be treated. Well, we all we got to look at human history. How have we done at treating this sin problem? No, everything we do inflames it. Because if it looks like it's healing it, then we start boasting about, look at the progress we're making. Which again leads us to a point of falling again. There's only one solution to the sin nature. And that is, is death and a new heart through being born again in Christ. That's the only thing that changes that. And truthfully... Everybody here and every professing believer that is striving to walk with God, striving to honor God with their lives, they know what that sin nature is because they wrestle with it and they don't want to succumb to it. So with God's help, with His Word, with the community of faith, with the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we combat that inerrant, uh, inherent nature that we've got from Adam. And if we go back to the garden... What was it about? It was about Adam and Eve and their self. They thought they knew better than God. They thought the word God gave them wasn't enough. They liked what they were exposed to with the lies of the enemy. And we see what it got them. And the very crux of our sin nature is self. 
And we see this in everything that happens, these tragedies over the past weekend. You had an individual with his own idea, not to excuse it, not to even put reason to it, because there is none. What we see is the nature, like the descendants of Cain with Lemek, total disregard for human sanctity, sanctity of human life. Complete. Same thing with abortion. We have more abortions because people don't want to be inconvenienced with a child. Well, there's an easy way to not get caught up with that responsibility of a child, isn't there? Just abstain from sex. Well, you know, God gave us sex for what? To procreate. He also, again, not being crass, not going any further, but also he blessed it. It is something that brings a man and a woman in an intimate relationship of marriage close together. It bonds them. That's why Paul talked about that. Will you, you know, connect Christ with a prostitute, talking to Corinth? And they're going into the temples, pagan temples and the temple prostitutes. So again, God gave us this for our intimate relationships physically. But look what man has done with sex. And what's behind that? Self, lust. And so again, what's going to fix that? I can tell you only one thing that's going to do that, and that is a redeemed person with a new heart that has a desire to honor their creator, their savior, and follow his commandment, his word, for a way that is God-honoring, God-glorifying. But we push back upon that. The only thing we've got left is our sin nature, and we can spend a lot of time there, but I want to get to the book of Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 says that he is Jesus, is his name, Yeshua in Hebrew, or really Joshua. But again, that name means God saves. Names are significant. But he's also Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. So right out of the gate, Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is communicating not only is Jesus an heir to the throne, but he is the anointed one. He's the promised one of God. He's the promised one to Abraham, who was going to be the father of a great nation that ultimately would bless the nations. And again, that was a proto-evangelon statement of the Messiah coming through his lineage, which Matthew chapter 1 shows us. So again, Jesus comes into the world as God's anointed Savior. And we know Matthew goes on and Luke goes on to give us the account that there's a uniqueness about Jesus beginning, and it was that it was a virgin birth, which again takes us back to Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman. And in that, he has a divine nature instead of a sin nature. Now, some would say, well, the sin nature comes through the man's seed. David said, I was created in sin where? In my mother's womb. So he was, he was born in sin. So again, man and woman has a part in this. But the seed of the woman, and again, the headship, has nothing to do with Adam. It had everything to do with God and the woman. And so in that, he became a new head of humanity, the qualified humanity of the redeemed. So that makes him, as Paul would elaborate in Romans, the new Adam, the second Adam. Okay? And so that gives us, through him, the doctrine of the redeemed. Because for those who place their faith in Jesus recognizing if he is the anointed one, he's the one that's been sent by my creator to save me from my sin. Through him, through that faith in my trusting God's word, I've been told that I'll be given a new heart. Jeremiah speaks to this in the new covenant. And in this new heart, I'll now have God's word written on my heart. So I don't have to be taught. And literally what that means is, you will know God in your heart. Paul would kind of rephrase it this way in Romans chapter 8. It says, His Spirit 
bears witness to our spirit. And the way that happens is, is that we've been born again. We have that new heart and we're spiritually now connected to our creator in Christ. And so now, and again, this doctrine is more we're going to unfold here. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased from our lostness and placed in the kingdom of God. We've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed in the kingdom of Christ. We have been taken from being dead in our sin to being alive in Christ. From having a stony heart to having a heart of flesh, not bad flesh, but soft, pliable, so that it can be moved and, I want to say manipulated, but that's a negative term. But the Holy Spirit can, yeah, mold our heart to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And again, in that, even love our neighbor as ourself. Because we look at the lineage of Adam and look at the history of humanity, how well do we do without God's help by loving our neighbors ourselves? <laughs> our neighbor is an opportunity to exploit, not to love. You know, we look at that, ooh, look who moved next door. Ooh, they got a nice lawnmower. Well, mine's broke, so I'm going to borrow theirs. You know, just simple things we see through humanity. That was a very light illustration. But anyhow, so you have these two books. Stated here. Now, from there, chapter 5 tells us, And all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he, what? Died. That's the Bible for the curse. Because what did God say when they disobeyed? What was going to happen? You're going to die. Now, as we talked about when we were in chapter 3, he wasn't just talking about physical death. But here, literally, this is where that separation becomes tangible. There is an end to life. Whereas if they had obeyed, they had the tree of life there, they could have lasted for eternity in a blessed environment by their Creator. But they knew better. They had something better waiting for them, they thought. But as we go through, Seth lived 105 years, and then he became the father of Enosh. And it said that he lived 807 years after he became the father of Enosh. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. So again, we're seeing that curse. The expansion of Adam's family. But it's right along there with the curse. Right along there with the rest of humanity. As we know with chapter 6, getting worse and getting worse and getting worse and getting worse. And literally, you go all the way down to verse 20, to where we have Enosh, um, or Jared, not Enosh, Jared's, Enosh's son. Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. And then you get to verse 21, we get to Enoch. So, of these individuals... Really not a whole lot's elaborated on them other than the curse is ever present. And there is this longevity. And so oftentimes we get caught up in, well, I wonder why they live so long. Well, we talked about this some in our own discussion. Well, God says be fruitful and multiply so they live longer and they could have more kids because the scripture keeps saying over and over again and they had other sons and daughters. They had other sons and daughters. But I think the real point to bring out, and I think uh, Pink does this the best, he brings out the fact that this longevity of all these individuals and even great, 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 great uncle or granddaddy Adam could talk about what it was like before sin. And they can just share generation after generation the horror of this sin. To me, I just see the, the, satis uh, the um, sustaining grace of God on Adam. Could you imagine bearing that and seeing it impact your children? Because remember, this is just the lineage of Adam through Seth. Adam had another bunch of youngins and grand youngins and great grands and great grands and great grands. Because we get to chapter 4 of the end, Lamech was one of his. The weight that must have been on him to know all of this is because I disobeyed. I disobeyed. 
and they all still hanging on to the promise because this is where we're going to be going. Adam's family continues to long for hope despite the curse. Nowhere have they forgotten what God told Eve. Because the scripture don't tell us how long Eve lived. But if the guys were living this long, and you may be thinking, well, these, they were, can you imagine she's been having youngins how long? Hundreds of years. That can't really be good on a person. You know, again, God's will being done. God can do some things. And we think about the limitations of now as being the norm of then. Doesn't necessarily go together. But still, let's just say Eve lived 500 years. For 500 years after the fall, what do you think she kept hanging on to? God promised the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of that serpent. And with every son that was born, I believe they just hung on to, this could be the one. Or with every descendant of Seth, this could be the one. Enosh, this could be the one. And it just went down through these generations. Because literally, we're going to jump ahead because I want you all to see this. Look at verse 29. When Lemek, and this is the good Lemek, has a son named Noah. He names him Noah. What does it say there in Scripture? Yeah. Yeah, so he is seeing Noah as the one that's going to bring comfort to them. Now again, where is he getting this from? Scripture don't tell us. So the only thing we can fall back on is God gave, them, gave him a revelation. That this boy is going to be a comfort to y'all. But um, let's go back up there. Verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and became a daddy. That's young for these guys. Oh, young whippersnappers. They already got a youngin. He names him Methuselah. Methuselah. Now, what do you think Methuselah's name means? Long time, yeah. We do know that he is the one that lived the longest, and there's a reason for that. His name, let me get this right, means or has the meaning when he dies, it shall be sent. Yeah. Now we know it's the flood. Because when Methuselah dies, guess what comes? It's the year of the flood. The year of the flood. So he lived all of these years. And it's interesting, another thing to notice with uh, Lemix. Um, I'm going to go to the next page. Verse 29. Yeah. Yeah. Look at verse 31 about Lemek. How long did he live and then died? 777 years. Hmm. But then what transpires? He died, and here comes the flood. So again, just a lot of things to go hmm about and just be amazed at what God's doing. But with Enoch, and I'm going to leave it on this one, then we can open up any questions right quick. The Bible says, look the way it's written. Verse 21, Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God. So for those 65 years, he was like the rest of the family. He was still descendant of Seth, called upon the name of Yahweh, acknowledging for who he is, appreciating for who he is, but really, his walk didn't get what we'd call serious 
And we'll look at how serious walking with God is next week. But it was after Methuselah was born. And do you think the revelation God gave Enoch about naming Methuselah and what his main name implied had any bearing on Enoch going, oh snap. And let's turn that around. Has God given us a word about what our future holds? But does it impact us like it impacted Enoch? Hmm, it should. Or on that next week. Okay, we'll stop there.